you think about like the brands that are today populating, you know, the fashion industry all over the world, there's not as many that can count on like, you know, 70 years and uh, even less that still belong to, to the same family. So what I can tell you looking, you know, from now to the beginning with like the lens of history is that in my opinion, for sure, the ability and the intelligence of an entrepreneur was to be able to look into the time that he was living. And at the end of the day, if you think about it, fashion is about interpreting the time that you're living in. And he did it successfully with an open mind and with a curiosity that he passed on. When my grandfather decided to found Max Mar, it was 1951, so it was really right after World War II and uh, Italy at the time was uh, developing uh, uh, this new, you know, uh, middle class, uh, which maybe didn't exist prior to that. And he looked into the opportunity of tapping into, into a market that didn't exist at the time, which was, in fact, you know, that uh, working, uh, you know, bourgeoisie that was developing in Italy and their wives. My grandfather decided to like, you know, used to say that he wanted to dress the doctor's wives, right? You know, starting from there, I think that like the big development was the idea of like building uh, a company which was based uh, on fashion, obviously looking into like, you know, the French couturier for the style but that had a very strong industrial component. And at the time, I think that Italy had this, you know, very strong component of industrial booming. So the two things merged. To be honest, I think that uh, Max Mara is the coat, and I know that, like, you know, there's been, like, it would be really at cost of sounding a little simplistic, but it is true that we are our coats. Coat was the base of really how the first collection was built, and, you know, yet, at the end of the day, it is what Max Mara as a brand has been internationally known for, so that's who we are, and, you know, the iconicity of a Max Mara coat also if you think about it, it represents a little bit how different codes have made and evolved within the history of the company, right? I mean, you know, you have like the first famous code that we've known for, which is the 101801, uh, designed by Anne-Marie Beretta in the 80s. And that's like, you know, almost 40 years ago. Bene. Then again, you have like the Manuela coat, which comes in the 2000s. Like definitely the evolution of like the first. And then today you have the teddy bear, right? So you have like this, uh, you know, different takes on something that is quite uh, consistently the same. The role of innovation is exactly the idea of like being able to understand what people that are your audience want and and in our business that would I think correspond to their lifestyle, how they live, whether they travel, whether they go to work, whether they need some comfortable fabrics or more strict you know trends and and needs for women are an expression of what they do for a living on a daily basis. So it would be absolutely self-referential to be convinced that you could still use the same things that you would use 50 years ago because the lifestyle of women was so different that it wouldn't be of any interest up to them, right? <laughs> There was like an Italian phase, I mean, where Italy really was our first market and, you know, it's an important one. And it still is an important market. I mean, I don't want to brag, but I am quite confident in saying that Max Mar is part of the Italian bringing, you know, it is part of Italian bringing for sure. Then, you know, in the 
50s, end of 60s, beginning of the 70s, there was definitely this uh, strong movement towards the European markets. I mean, in the early 80s, we also moved to America and Japan, which at the time were, you know, markets quite interesting, you know, again, if I look back at the history of the company, it kind of reflects a little bit what happened in you know, the world in the past 70 years in terms of you know, economy which were growing. We were one of the first brands really to develop a distribution in China, which right now represents, to be honest, one of the biggest markets for us, as well as obviously Europe as a whole being, you know, a really important market and the United States. We opened the first store in Lisbon, I think that was 10 years ago, which is one of our flagships. It's a city that represents very well today what contemporary women want in terms of, you know, a good balance between a lifestyle of culture, history, but also international flavor because Lisbon is a getaway to you know, the Atlantic. So for us, it's a market that uh, has become strategic, to be honest with you, as soon as we tapped into it. I think about the Max Mara story as a continuous narrative. I always think of it as like writing a book and each collection that we reveal uh, is not a new story, it's a new chapter in the book. So there are themes that we develop from uh, one chapter to the next, maybe characters you've met before. I mean, the Max Mara woman is someone we're all familiar with. Maybe in each chapter we discover a new aspect of her, uh, a, a new facet of, of her style or her personality or some unexpected plot in twist. Um, but um, it's the same story that continues from season to season. The target is intelligent women uh, of all ages because uh, Max Mara uh, has over the past 10, 15 or 20 years, been reaching out to a younger customer, I think, uh, effectively. But um, unlike maybe other brands, we've been doing that without abandoning the existing customer, a woman who has been with us for maybe 10, 20 or, or 30 or even longer, uh, 30 years. So the special magic of Max Mara is producing an item or a look uh, which can be interpreted by many, many women. But I think that connects them all to me is their sense of their own power. And well, that comes from their intelligence, their smartness. The design process always uh, begins, well, with two aspects. One is looking back at what Max Mara has done, very often using the archive. I believe you visited it. It's a very, very rich place. And then the second part of the inspiration is looking outside Max Mara's story. And that, for example, is the reason why we came here to, to, to Lisbon, to discover something new, something we'd never looked at before, to introduce uh, a new element, a, a new strand to the Max Mara story. When I was researching this collection, I was looking for a woman that I could be inspired by, a powerful woman. And in the collection of the Gilbenkian, I discovered the Nikai Skapinakis painting of Natalia Choria. And it showed a very regal, quite grand woman staring impassively as if into the future. And I wanted to know who she was. And I discovered that this woman uh, was very well known in, in Portugal, a poet, uh, an intellectual, a campaigner, a social activist, a socialite, she loved to party. The, the character and the language of her poetry talks about her voluptuousness, her sensuality, her, her sexiness. And this collection explores uh, a side of Max Mara that is sometimes 
not explored so often, you know, it's a, a little bit curvier, more voluptuous, sexier and more sensual than other collections that we have produced in the past. The person who helped me develop the, these ideas was a, another of your national heroes, your, the current Queen of Fado, in, I think, uh, Camino, who helped me uh, to interpret the work of uh, Natalia Horia in a way that was convincing, which expressed a certain idea of Portugueseness, but also, also satisfies uh, the Max Mara philosophy.